Luke chapter 20. Tonight we begin with verse 19. We read here, And the chief priest and the scribes the same hour sought to lay hands on him. And they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. So this scripture takes us back to the text just previous in which Jesus, in talking to the scribes and the Pharisees, gave to them a parable about a certain man who had a vineyard. And he went away to a far country for a long time. And at the season, he sent back a servant that he might receive the fruit from the vineyard, but they mistreated the servant and sent him away empty. So he sent another servant, finally a third servant. And finally the Lord said, I'll send my own son. Surely they will honor him. But the husband, when they saw him, reasoned among themselves, saying, this is the heir, come let's kill him, that the vineyard may be ours, the inheritance is ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. And what therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come and destroy these husbandmen and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. Now they knew that the vineyard was a parable that dealt with the nation Israel. In Isaiah, the figure of the vineyard is used for the nation of Israel, where the Lord speaks of the vineyard that did not bring forth the fruit that he desired. And therefore, he allowed it to just go sort of wild brought forth wild grapes. And so Jesus is picking up this parable of the vineyard. He gives it a little different slant. The Lord is still looking for fruit from his vineyard. Sends back servants who are mistreated, sent away empty. Finally sends his only beloved son, figuring that surely they will reverence him but instead they plot his death. Now it is interesting, at this point, already they have plotted the death of Jesus. As we look in John's Gospel, chapter 8, after the raising of Lazarus from the dead, they had a meeting and they said, what are we going to do? This fellow is doing so many miracles, everybody is turning to him. And if this continues, the Roman government is going to come and take away our place. We're going to lose our jobs. And Caiaphas, being the high priest, said, you don't really understand things, fellas. Don't you realize that one man is going to have to die for the nation, that the whole nation might be saved? And so they had already begun their plotting of the death of Jesus. Thus, as Jesus speaks this parable, the Father sends his only beloved Son to gather the fruit, and they say, you know, here's the heir, let's kill him, and then the whole inheritance will be ours. And Jesus said, what will the Father do? He will surely take away the vineyard and give it unto others. And they cried out, God forbid, but uh, they, they realized that he understood their plots. They, they rightly discerned that this parable was spoken against them. For he went on to quote from Psalm 118 concerning the stone which was set of not by the builders, the same has become the chief cornerstone. And upon whomsoever that stone, whosoever will fall upon the stone will be broken. Upon whom the stone falls, it will grind him to powder. So at that point, when the chief priests, the scribes, in the same hour, 
they sought to lay hands on him. Now, their desire to lay hands upon him is really apprehending him or arresting him. They really wanted at this point to arrest him and to get him out of the way. It was a violent apprehending of him that they were desiring at this point. But they reasoned among themselves, realizing that if they did this, the people at this point would turn against them because still uh, they were listening to Jesus and he had the ear of the people. So they didn't lay their hands on him for fear of the people. These people, these men, were astute politicians. They had their ear to the popular movement. They followed the trends and the attitudes. That they were always conscious of what the general attitude of the people was in order that they might sort of play along with what is uh, the popular movement at this time. Looking and testing the pulse of the people, and right now the people were towards Jesus, so they, they had a problem. They wanted to lay hands on him. Uh, they couldn't lay hands on him. At this particular point, it wasn't a wise move from a political standpoint. So we read, they watched him, and sent forth spies that they should pretend that they were righteous men. These fellows came out then, sent by the chief priest, who acted as though they were really sincere seekers for the truth. They came with questions to Jesus acting like they were really searching for the truth. But in reality, they were dishonest questions. Dishonest in the sense that they weren't really looking for an answer to the questions. But the questions were only designed to create a dispute. They were looking for an argument. A lot of people are that way today. They'll come up and ask a question, not because they really want an answer to that question, but they want you to state your position so they can challenge your position and dispute with you and argue with you over the position that you have stated. And so the, the only reason why they ask a question is to open an argument. Jehovah Witnesses are this way. They'll ask a question just to open an argument and, and to get you in, in the discussion of an issue. They really don't want an answer. They only want to dispute the issue. They're really dishonest questions because a dishonest question really, a questioner is not really seeking the answer for his question, but only trying to raise the issue upon which he can dispute. They were wanting to take hold, it said, of his words. They wanted him to say something that they could use against him. They were seeking to trap him in his speech in order that they might carry the accusations to the rulers. And uh, the whole idea now was to get him to say something that would be contrary to uh, Rome so that they could accuse him of sedition. And uh, they're really baiting him and uh, trying to get him to say something that would be considered seditious or treasonable. So they asked him, saying, and notice uh, these guys are beginning the whole thing by just uh, setting him up. Master, we know that you say and teach what is right. Neither do you accept anybody's person. 
But you teach the way of God truly. They're, they're just seeking now to set them. We know that, you know, you're a straight shooter. You don't care who it hurts. You're going to tell the truth. You lay it out straight. We, we recognize that. And, and so they're really now seeking to set him up. They're pretending to be righteous men. They're pretending to seek the truth from a man who speaks straight on issues. Issues that they are pretending really trouble them. And they want him to give it a frank and an honest answer. And so then they spring the question. Is it lawful for us to give taxes to Caesar or not? Now they really figured that they had Jesus in a catch-22. They figured that there was no way out for Jesus. Either a yes or a no, he condemns himself. It's a very clever question indeed. If Jesus says, yes, it is right to give taxes unto Caesar, and these taxes that they are referring to here are the personal taxes that were levied by the Roman government just because you existed. You had to pay to live, to be alive. And it was one of the most unjust of all taxes, and they hated it. In fact, this particular taxing caused a rebellion. It caused a real revolt at one time among the Jews, this particular taxing, and all of the Jews hated this taxing. Now, if Jesus said, yes, it is right to pay this tax unto Caesar, then all of the people who have been listening to him, these people that have been listening intently to what he has to say, they're going to say, wait a minute, this guy is a Roman collaborator. We don't want to follow him. And so he will lose the popular appeal that he presently has with the people if he tells them, yes, they should pay this tax to Caesar. On the other hand, if he says, no, you shouldn't pay this tax. It's an unfair tax. Then they will immediately march down to the Roman governor and they will say, this man is guilty of sedition. He is trying to incite the people to riot against Rome. He's telling them they ought not to pay taxes to Caesar. And he would be arrested and accused of sedition. So they really thought they had him trapped. He's, there's no way out for him. Either a yes or a no answer is going to nail him. And, and so they, it was a clever question. You have to give them credit for that. They really thought this one through. It was really a clever question. So Jesus, perceiving their craftiness, said unto them, Why do you tempt me? It's a mistake to think that you can deceive Jesus. You know, they might come pretending to be righteous men, pretending to have honest questions, but Jesus saw right through them. Any person who attempts to deceive God is himself the one who is really deceived. If you think that you're fooling God, and there are a lot of people who are attempting to fool God by feigning righteousness, feigning to be a righteous person. These people were feigning, it says, to be righteous people. But the Lord saw right through 
their whole pretext. He saw what was in their heart, the deceit, the guile. And he sees right through you and right through me. And then he said unto them, show me a penny. Literally a denarius. It was a Roman coin that was equivalent to a day's wage for a laboring man. In another parable of Jesus, you remember that he gave the parable of the man who had a vineyard uh, that he wanted harvested or his fields harvested. And so he came into the marketplace in the morning and he found some men standing there and he said, go out and labor in my field today and I will give you a denarius for your day's wage. And the men agreed it was a fair wage for the day. And so give me a denarius, he said. It is interesting to me that Jesus didn't have a denarius on him, on his person. In fact, it would appear that Jesus just didn't carry money with him. Remember when they were in Capernaum and the tax collector there was demanding an unjust tax from Peter and Jesus. And Jesus said, who, do they, who are they supposed to tax? The strangers or the citizens? He said, the strangers. He said, then the citizens don't have to pay. Peter said, no. And I'm sure they said this in front of the tax collector who was standing there trying to collect the tax. And Jesus is just pointing out to him, you know, that he's making an unjust demand. But Peter said, so the guy won't be offended. Go. Jesus said to Peter, so that you won't offend the guy, go catch a fish and take the coin out of his mouth and give it to this guy. And, uh, but Jesus didn't have coins with him. He didn't carry money. I don't know that Jesus ever did carry money. The Bible tells us that Judas was the one that carried the purse for the disciples and that Jesus was actually supported by wealthy women who ministered to him out of their substance. There were a group of women, I mean, Luke, the eighth chapter, tells us the names of some of those women that actually were supporting Jesus' ministry. Seems a little strange, doesn't it, that um, Jesus was supported by women who followed him and supported his ministry. Uh, they ministered, and that word ministered there means they provided for his needs out of their substance. They followed him around, providing and taking care. And so Jesus had to ask for a coin. He wasn't carrying a coin himself. And notice, though, they were carrying a coin with Caesar's image on it. They were carrying the Roman coinage. They had been trafficking with Caesar's coinage. And so Jesus asked them for a coin which they were able to produce, which signified that they were using Caesar's coins. Show me a coin, he said. And then he said, whose image or superscription is it? Now, the image on the coin was the image of Caesar. On the back side of the coin, it had the words Pontifus Maximus. Caesar the Pontifus Maximus, or the supreme ruler, the maximum pontiff, or the supreme ruler. I have a coin 
with Caesar's image on it. I meant to bring it tonight, but you wouldn't be able to see it if I held it up. It, it's about the size of a dime, but I just wanted to do it so you could see a coin, a Roman coin from that um, period of time with Caesar's image. I like it because it, it, because it has significance to me. I look at that and uh, think about this story. And so they answered him, <coughs> Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. Give to Caesar. That's, you say it has his image on it, and then give it to Caesar. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Now, the Bible does teach that we as Christians are to be in subjection to those who are in authority over us. Paul in Romans chapter 13, and of course writing to the Romans, who were living in the city of Rome, under the Roman rule, he says to them, be in submission or subjection to those that are in authority over you. Give honor to whom honor is due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Pay your taxes. Live according to the laws. <coughs> And they are encouraged to be obedient and live according to the laws of the land. If I am living in a society, a developed society, culture, then I owe something to that culture for the maintaining of the government. I owe my share of taxes to take care of the fire department, the police department, and the various governmental agencies. And so as a Christian, I am to respect the government under which I live, and I am to be obedient to be submission and to pay my taxes, to render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar. There is only one area where that would not apply. And that is if Caesar would demand something of me that would violate my conscience before God. And when Peter and John and the apostles were commanded not to preach anymore in the name of Jesus, they said, whether we should obey God or man, judge ye, but we know that we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And so they violated the command that was given to them not to speak anymore in the name of Jesus. We are living under a higher authority, the authority of God. And when the government's authority would violate my conscience before God, should that be the case, then I would have to be subject unto God. Later on, when the apostles were arrested again, they said, didn't we strictly command you that you weren't to speak anymore concerning Jesus Christ? And Peter answered them, we must obey God. We're not going to stop. We've got to obey God. So if it comes a matter of conscience, where Caesar would be demanding that I submit to Caesar instead of the Lord, then I have to 
be civilly disobedient. In the times of the early church, thousands of believers were martyred because of their refusal to say that Caesar is Lord. As they were lighting the fires to burn them at the stake, they would just say, say Caesar is Lord and we will stop. And they would beg and implore them to just say Caesar is Lord. Fox's Book of Martyrs tells of some of the young people, teenagers that were martyred, and how the executioners really didn't want to kill them and just begged them almost, pleaded with them, just say Caesar is Lord, but they would refuse to do it because that would be in violation of their conscience knowing that Jesus is Lord. And thousands of them were disobedient to the civil government because the civil government was requiring something of them that would have violated their conscience before God. So when it comes a matter of conscience, my conscience before God, I must obey God rather than man. But in the issues that are not a matter of conscience, you say, well, it bothers my conscience to just drive 55 miles an hour on the freeway, you know. I, I feel that's restricting to me. I, I would rather drive 100 miles an hour. Well, uh, I'm afraid that doesn't count. Uh, that's not a... a you know, a legitimate uh, violation of conscience. But on the other half or side of the coin, Jesus said, render unto God the things that are God's. You see, God has a right to make certain demands upon me. Even as the government has a right to make certain demands upon me. The government has provided for me highways to drive my car on. The government has provided streetlights in my neighborhood so that the neighborhood is lit up and not all dark. They provide street sweepers that go through and keep the street clean. They provide men that come and pick up my trash each week. They provide my police protection, my fire protection. They provide a lot of things I'm not interested in, but yet they're there. And thus... Because they are providing these things for me, I have a certain obligation to them. And it is right that I discharge that obligation, that I render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. But in the same token, God has provided me with life. I owe my life to God. He has provided me with help. He has provided me with strength. He has provided the air that I breathe, the water I drink. And when you really get down to it, I owe a lot more to God than I owe to the government. Sometimes I think I might be able to get along pretty well without the government. Especially some of the government agencies. In fact, if I could, I would abolish a lot of them. But I could never get along without God. I've often wished that, you know, I could escape to an island in the South Pacific and just to live a more simple life. You know, if I want to build me a little hut, I can build it without going down and having to file all the plans and 
get all of the permits and, you know, go through all the hassle that they require. I hate that kind of bureaucracy. I can't abide it. But I could never get along without God. I might be able to get along without government. I could never get along without God. I owe God so much, my life itself. And thus in rendering unto God the things that are God, because my life really comes to me from God, I owe my life to Him, therefore I should render unto God my life. Paul said, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's a reasonable thing that God would demand that I present my body unto Him, my life. Rendering unto God the things that are God's. I owe to God a debt of love, gratitude, praise, thanksgiving. To the government, we owe for the material things. To God, we owe for the spiritual things. And our debt to God is much greater than the debt to the government. And so many times we take the first part, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, we say, yeah, we should do that. But we skip that second part, and we are not really rendering unto God those things that are rightfully His. And how important that we take the second half of the injunction of Jesus and we render unto God the things that are God's. Now it says they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer, and they held their peace. I imagine at this point they were shaking their heads. They were sure that they had Jesus trapped. They were, they were certain there was no way out. This is catch-22, man, in its greatest form, you know. Yes or no, he's trapped. We've got him. And when Jesus gave them the answer, they were just flabbergasted. I mean, it was so right on. He didn't offend the people at all, and he didn't offend the government. You know, he, he was going to surely offend one or the other. He had to, but he came out clean. And notice the threefold effect upon them. First of all, they could not take hold of him because they could not catch him in his words. They couldn't trap him. And so they secondly really marveled at his answer. I'm sure that there was a tremendous admiration that they had. I mean, they thought, wow, that's sharp. That's good. He really slipped out of that one. <laughs> and the third thing is they held their peace. They had to. Nothing they could do. So, the first group failed. So the next group comes up. And they've got a question that has always stumped everybody. And so they'll throw their question at Jesus because no one has been able to have an answer for this question. It's sort of that question, sort of like, where did Cain get his wife? You know, it was one that, was always being asked by those who were of the Sadducean persuasion. It was their coup de grace in any argument. They would bring up this particular question and always win the day. It was a hypothetical case. It uh, was an interesting question that no one could adequately answer for them. 
and thus seem to always prove their point as being right. We'll look at this question next Thursday night. <laughs> as Jesus gives these boys their comeuppance. Shall we pray? Lord, we recognize that we owe a great debt to you. A debt so great that we can never pay it. Lord, we realize how little we really have to offer to you. We realize, Lord, that the heavens of heavens are yours. The earth is yours, the fullness thereof, everything that is in it. Therefore, Lord, we really wonder what can we render unto you for all of your benefits that you have given to us. Lord, we realize about all we can do is just respond to your love. To take the cup of salvation that you have offered, to call upon your name, and to offer you our lives such as they are. And so we render unto you, Lord, our praise, our love, our thanksgiving. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. Shall we stand? <clears throat> May the Lord help you as you consider just what you should be rendering unto God. As we render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, Caesar let us, lets us know what he wants. He's very specific. But in rendering unto God, that is in much left up to us. David, the psalmist, in 116 said, What shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits unto me? A, a, a question that we should all be pondering. What can I give to God for all that he's given to me, for all of his benefits, for all of his goodness to me? What can I give to God? The big question is, what can I give to God that he needs? And if you ask that, nothing. <laughs> God doesn't need a thing. And you know how hard it is to give something to a person who doesn't need anything? My kids have that problem. I don't need a thing. And I feel sorry for them when they go out to Christmas time and try and get me a present because I don't need a thing. I mean, if I need a tool, I go out and get it. And, and I really don't need anything. And if they buy me a tool, they buy me a cheaper one than I would have bought myself. <laughs> you know. And I like nice tools. <laughs> but they can't afford the kind of tools that I like. And yet they want to give Dad something. And, and I do feel sorry for them in, in this dilemma of what shall we get Dad for Christmas. But you know, I am so totally content in their love, in their presence. And just having them as my children, just having them around, that they don't have to give me a thing. So filled with joy, just having them as my children. And you know, with God, what can you really give to God that he needs? Not a thing. He can afford so much more than what you could ever give. That it's just having you as his child. 
just having you around, just having that fellowship with you, that nearness with you, that's what God desires. Oh, that we would give him our hearts, our time, Spending time with him, sharing special times with him. That's what he longs for. Let's render to God things that are God's. Let's really seek to do it. And God bless you and minister to you as you walk in fellowship with him.